Hello there and welcome to the good old days of radio show. This is John Tefteller, your host, and we are in the midst of a salute to Mr. Arch Obler, one of the poet laureates of radio, along with Orson Welles and, of course, the great Norman Corwin, who we will feature in an upcoming series somehow. We'll work on that one. Um, but it's Arch Obler time. Uh, normally, the only things we've done in the past with Arch Obler have been the Lights Out broadcasts because those type of creepy, weird horror shows seem to attract a big audience these days. But we are in this particular episode, as we did last week, we are looking at the lighter side of Arch Obler. Arch Obler was not only able to write creepy, weird horror stories, he wrote patriotic plays, he wrote unusual plays, he wrote all kinds of things, and they were not always just creepy and weird. There's a lot of great writing and a lot of lighthearted material. And we are so fortunate to be able to have with us this week, as we had last week, um, a gentleman who actually appeared on these programs with Arch Obler back when he was very young. He's referred to uh, by Obler in one of the shows as the rising young star. His name is Tommy Cook. And Tommy, welcome back to the good old days of radio show. Well, it's nice to be with you, uh, John. Uh, you know, I'm just about, uh, I'm approaching 93 years old right now. And to go back to the uh, Golden days of radio is uh, uh, very, very um, important to me, keeps me going. You know, um, as uh, you mentioned, the three great um, writer directors in the golden days of radio, Arch Obler, Norman Corwin, and Arch, I can remember Norman Corwin. You know, um, his father lived to be almost 110 and his brother almost 103. And Norman Corwin, I think, uh, lived to be around 100. And on his birthday, they grouped around him and uh, he said, Oh, oh, to be 99 again. What a joy that would be. <laughs> oh, yeah, to be 99 again. So uh, here I am, 93, and to be with you, and I feel like I'm going back to those marvelous days of uh, radio. So let's do it. All right. Well, the show for today is something you did on July 26th, 1945, for the show Arch Obler's Plays. Um, this was not Lights Out or Every Man's Theater. This was yet another show he had where he featured plays that he had written. Um, it's called My Chicago. I realize that you haven't heard this in a long, long time, maybe maybe since the day you did it, for all I know. Um, but you're going to listen to it right here along with me on the Good Old Days of Radio show. And hopefully it brings back some wonderful memories and some stories you can tell about doing it. So let's go right to it. It's My Chicago from July 26, 1945. Right. Mutual presents Arch Obler's Plays. The Mutual Broadcasting System has the pleasure of presenting the 16th broadcast of a special 26-week series of plays by radio playwright Arch Obler. In this series, we hope to bring you dramas full of the excitement and the meaning of plays told in relation to the expanding world in which we live. Tonight's play will be introduced by Arch Obler. There is a city by Lake Michigan where I was born and schooled. As a native son then, at present a few thousand miles removed, I bring you, purely in fun, my Chicago, as seen through the eyes of another Chicagoan, 11-year-old Tommy, who at the moment is writing a very important letter. Dear Twee Sam, I'm writing you this letter because my teacher, Miss Rogers, says that if all the children in our room write letters to you Chinese children, we will have understanding between nations, which is a very good thing. My father, who is looking over my shoulder as I write this, says... That's a lot of hooey. We ought to exchange beer with them. But I do not like beer, so I will continue to write this letter. Miss Rogers gave us a list of things we ought to write about. First, where we live. 
Our house is on Woodlawn Avenue, which is on the south side of the city of Chicago, which is in the state of Illinois, which is the most important state in the United States of America. My father, who was looking over my shoulder, says... Hooey, how about California? Hollywood? Pin-up girls? But since I have never been to California, Illinois is still the greatest state in the United States of America. First, I will tell you about my room which, of course, is also located in the city of Chicago. It is my very own room. Except, of course, when my Uncle Frederick, who is a farmer in the southern part of the state, comes to visit us, and then he sleeps in my room. And except when my Uncle Joe, who is a traveling salesman for a hardware store in St. Louis, comes to visit us, and then he sleeps in my room. And except when my Aunt Henrietta, who is my mother's sister, fights with her husband, and then she sleeps in my room... It is my very own room. My father, who was looking over my shoulder, says... That small fry reads like sarcasm. But since I do not know very clear what scarcism is, I will ignore the remark, like my sister Ellen always says, and continue. My room is a very special place, because so far every day of my life has started here. I will now tell you about my day. It always begins with my mother coming into my room and waking me up. Tommy. Tommy, it's after seven. You've got to be in school. You can't be late to school again. All right, all right. I know you're awake. Open the other eye and get up. Tommy, did you hear me? Yes, Mom. Now get up. I want to talk to you, Mr. Tommy. You're awake, aren't you? Yes, Mom. I have a little matter to discuss with you. Tommy, what did I say when you asked me if you could have rabbits in your room? What did I say? You, uh... You, uh... Yeah. You said no, Mama. All right, then. Your sister Ellen tells me that you've brought some sort of an animal into this house. Is it a rabbit? No, Mama. Then you have brought an animal into this house. Well, where is it? Under the bed. Under the... Oh, no. Yes, Mama. What is it? What? Well, you know that knife that Uncle Frederick gave me for my birthday? The one you hid until I grew up? Yes, but I... I swapped it with Sam for some Jap money his brother sent from Okinawa or someplace. But what is under... I swapped the Jap money with Al for a real bullet out of a machine gun out of a P-38, which had shot down two Zs Will you and a tell Tony. me what's under that bed? But that's what I'm telling you. I swapped the bullet for it. For what? What? I don't see for myself. No, Mama, you'd better not. Why? Because it's in a jar and it's a spider. Spider? Yes, and just a little old black widow spider. Black widow? Oh, oh! Oh, But it's just a little one, Mama. It's just a little one. Next, my teacher, Miss Rogers, says you would be interested in knowing about people in Chicago. There are many people in Chicago. My father, who is looking over my shoulder, says... That is a brilliant remark. I do not think that is a very brilliant remark, because there are many people in Chicago. First, there is my mother, whom... who... whom I have already told you about. Second, there is my father, who is looking over my shoulder, who is my mother's husband. That is another bright remark. Then there is my sister, Ellen, who is older than I am and very silly like all women are. That is the brightest remark. And there are my aunts and uncles and cousins and all my grandmothers and grandfathers are dead. There is my teacher, Miss Rogers, who is very old because once she met Woodrow Wilson, who was a president about whom they made a moving picture all in color. My father, who was looking over my shoulder, just said, Oh, immortality, where is thy technicolor? Which I do not understand. And then there are the people with whom I play at school. My best friend Fatso, Joe, and Freddie, and Billy, and Jake, and Arnie. Only they are not people being only kids like I am. And I've just about run out of people except for a policeman and fireman and the man who fixes our refrigerator and the garbage man and all the cops and detectives and gangsters who are in jail and... And old Miss Scrap Apple. Only that isn't her name, but it's the only way I can say it. Who's the smartest lady in all Chicago. 
and who owns the candy store near our school where all we kids buy our candy and ice cream, which is one of the seven basic foods and very good for young children. Oh, it's you again. Yes, Miss Rapapple. Business? Yes, Miss Rapapple. <clears throat> Such politeness indicates only one thing. You haven't got any money. No, Miss Rapapple. When will you pay me? Saturday. Prospect? Going to clean the weeds off the hardware man's back lot. Salary? Six bits. Uh, 75 cents. Exploitation. Worth a dollar. Yeah, Miss Rapapple. Insist on it. Yes, Miss Rapapple. Soda or Sunday? Soda, Miss Rapapple. Soda. One scoop or two? Uh, two, please. Two, please. Miss Rapapple. Mm-hmm. You know everything. Hmm. Sure. Sure, Mrs. Brain. Well, what's your problem, Miss Anthony? I haven't got a problem. I just want to know something. So? What? How do you get to be rich? What did you say? How do you get to be rich? Here you are. So drink it before it loses its fizz. Yes, sir. Rich. <laughs> Look who he's asking. Mm. Gosh, you're rich. Secondhand soda fountain. Mm. Six mm. bottles of chocolate syrup. Writing paper, pencils, mm. licorice candy, and gumdrops. Sure, sure. Mm. But don't you worry about getting rich. What you should worry about is how to get poor. Huh? If you would read something besides your Mr. Dick Tracy column, you would know. Pretty soon, the only way to be happy will be to be poor people. So close your mouth and drink your soda. How long do you think soda water bubbles will wait? Oh, yes, sir. I do not read your Mr. Dick Tracy. So I have a very fine education on the day after tomorrow. The day after tomorrow, everybody's home will be so filled with revolving ice boxes and vacuum cleaners that blow and vacuum cleaners that suck and home movie machines that talk and airplanes that go straight up and down and fancy automobiles with wings that come off and radios and televisions and hot blowers and coal blowers and machines for freezing and machines for cooking and machines for washing and machines for drying and machines for ironing and machines for blowing perfume, and machines for reading books out loud, and machines for making records, and machines for playing records. Well, who, I ask you, with all these machines will have room left in the house to live in but the poor? Oh. <laughs> Gee, you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I am funny. <laughs> so, so, thank you, sorry. No, I can hear you finished. I'll make another little one, maybe, huh? Well, gosh, I... On the house. On the house. Oh, gee. <laughs> After all as yet, you're not rich. Tommy. Yes, Miss Rapapple? Don't worry about being rich. What I was laughing about before, inside the small job, was a very large truth. The fancy automobiles and the airplanes that go straight up and down and the televisions and the coal freezers and the washers and the dryers, they're very nice. It should be that everyone should have them. But what is in your house is not so important as what is in your heart. So what will it be now, one scoop or two? <laughs> Miss Rogers, my teacher, says that you Chinese boys are very interested in everything about Chicago. She said I should write to you about historical places and streets. Mr. Abraham Lincoln came from Illinois, where Chicago is, which is historical fact. Chicago used to be Fort Dearborn, but the Indians massacred everybody. The entire population, including men, women, and children. But the result that everybody was wiped out, so they had to start all over, so they called it Chicago. The place where Fort Dearborn used to be is memorated on the Link Bridge, which is over the Chicago River downtown. And I have been there many times with my best friend, Fatso. Fatso and me... I... Me... 
stand on the bridge and discuss the historical facts about the Fort Dearborn Massacre, which is very historical. Gee, I bet you I could dive right off of here and do three somersaults before I hit the water. Sure, sure. I bet you I could start swimming and swim all the way across the lake to Milwaukee and, mm-hmm. and do it all on my back. Okay, okay, Superman. Can't even swim across the bathtub. You stop talking and let me think. What you thinking about? If I'd have been there, I'd never let him kill him. Who? The Indians, you creep. I'd never let him get away with the massacre. Well, well, what could you have done, huh, Tommy? Oh, things. Yeah, what? Gee, you have to get so... so technical. What's that? Gosh, Fatso, don't you know anything? I know if those old Indians were going to massacre and scalp you, they just massacre and scalp you, and you couldn't do anything. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I'm hungry. I'm going home. Okay, me too. <laughs> Next, my teacher, Miss Rogers, says I should tell you about our schools and school systems. The paper she gave us says, with emphasis on the universities and colleges, including Northwestern and the University of Chicago and Armour Institute. My father just said... The heck with the University of Chicago. No football team. Since we live on the south side, I do not know about Northwestern University, which is across the border in Evanston, Illinois, and which sometimes has good football teams. So, I will tell you about the University of Chicago. It is very large. They do not like to have small children running around in the grass. Everybody there is very smart. The buildings are covered in ivy. Everybody has lots of books. My father, who was looking over my shoulder, says... No football team. My pop once played football at Hyde Park High School, and so he is very bitter. I think that even though they have no football team, the University of Chicago is pretty good. My teacher, Miss Rogers, says, if you're smart, they let you go through very fast. Fatso says his cousin knows a girl whose uncle or aunt or somebody went through the whole University of Chicago and graduated with a real diploma in only one week. My father just said... (laughs) What can you expect? No football team. Once when I was very young, I went to the University of Chicago. I'll tell you about it. What did you say, boy? Could you... Could you ladies tell me where I could find the principal? Principal? Of the university? Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you mean the dean? No, ma'am, the principal. Well, there's a number of people who are principal. You see, the university is divided up into so many departments, and each department has a head. And is there someone you're looking for in some department, a brother or a sister? Oh, no, ma'am. Do you ladies go here? Well, not exactly. I'm in the registrar's office, and Miss Hudson's a graduate student. Oh, sure. Do you know all about it? About what? About everything around here. I'm not so sure. How about you, Mary? No statement. What's on your mind, boy? Well, how do you get in? You mean as a student? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, you certainly have a great deal of time before you have to worry about that. We have them young here, but you're even younger than that. Does it cost very much? Cost? Mm, yes and no, depending on who your father is and whether you're smart enough to get endowed and things like that. Look, boy, you're much too young to be worried. But I gotta know. But why this great interest in university education? Uh, don't you think you ought to go to high school first? They don't teach enough. Enough of what? Do you know about the quiz kids? Yeah, sure. I gotta be one. You? Could you tell me what I gotta do to get in there? What I gotta oh, wait do... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you want to be a quiz kid for? Because then I'll be so smart I won't have to go to school anymore. Now, what in the world makes you think... <laughs> See, lady, don't you see? If I go here to the university, I get everything all at once, and then I can go on the radio and make a lot of money, and I don't have to go to school anymore, and I can buy an airplane and be an aviator, and I can do it all when I'm just little, have lots of time left over. Yes. That's a wonderful idea. Wealthy and wise by the time you're 12 and spend the rest of the time until you're very old... You say about 22, having fun and doing what you want to do. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Now, what do they teach you here? Will you tell me, please? <laughs> well, you start out with the survey courses, the biological sciences, the physical sciences, and the social sciences. 
You begin with the variety and relationship among living organisms, then you go to the dynamics of living organisms, and then to the discussion of unlearned and learned behavior, evolution, heredity, and eugenic. Then you go into humanities, introducing yourself to the general aspects of Western culture. Go ahead, Mary. I'm out of breath. Then follows a discussion of physical sciences in terms of mathematics, motion, astronomy, the kinetic theory, then into the chemical constitution and classification of rocks and minerals, the weathering process, Earth's features and actions of waves, winds, streams, and glaciers, historical geology and maps and meteorology and maps of meteorology, and finally mathematics. Only a few, such as algebra, trigonometry, and analytical geometry, and atomic motions ending with the constitution of matter interpreted by molecular and atomic theory. Take it, Junior. Then follow the social scientists, learning through both descriptive and analytical terms the emergence into institutional structure of contemporary society, emphasizing the interrelationship of geography, economy, sociology, political science, anthropology, history, and other disciplines concerned with human nature and social affairs, integrating them all within one structure. That, of course, will only be the beginning. Understand? Yes, ma'am. Well, so long. Boy, what... Boy, where are you going? I, I promised my mother I'd be home early to bring home the groceries. So long, University. My teacher, Miss Rogers, says that you Chinese children would be very interested in hearing about Chicago city government. My father, who was still looking over my shoulder, says... Oi, tell him about the monkey house in Lincoln Park. The city government of the city of Chicago lives in the city hall. This is a very large building downtown which is very crowded and full of policemen and aldermen and where you buy dog licenses and where the mayor lives. My father just said... Who is a Democrat and unfortunately doesn't even chase after fire engines. My father is a Republican. My mother is a Democrat. When there's going to be an election, we have very large fights at our house. My father just said... Disagreements and discussions, my boy. Disagreements and discussions. When I am big, I have a small boy who is writing a letter because his teacher makes him do it. And this letter is to somebody away in China. I will not lean over my boy's shoulder and pass remarks. <laughs> okay, okay, Thomas. I can take a subtle hint. Tell him about that assessment they slapped on me for fixing that street a mile away. My father has now left the room. <sighs> Next, my teacher, Miss Rogers, wants me to tell you about the transportation system. Chicago has a very good transportation system. If you have the money, you can ride on streetcars or buses, which there are two kinds, one decker and two deckers, or you can ride in the elevated. And we have a new subway, and also there are many cabs. Now, if my father was here looking over my shoulder, he would say... Except on rainy days and when you want one. Since I do not have much money, I do not ride in cabs. Except once when we had to take a cab to the cemetery because we were late to the funeral of my cousin, Mr. Woods, which was fun. I personally sometimes take streetcars, but mostly I walk or hitchhike. Miss Rogers, my teacher, says we should not use words which you Chinese can't find in a dictionary. And I have looked up hitchhike and couldn't find it which is too bad for the dictionary, because hitchhike is a good word, so I will tell you about it. If you were standing in a Chinese street and didn't have any money to catch a streetcar, and a camel came along, like I saw in a movie about China in which Loretta Young was a nurse, and you put out your thumb when the camel picked you up, that would be a hitchhike. This concludes the transportation system, which I often use when I go downtown with my mother, which is very often. Tommy, take your feet off the seat. Tommy, I'm talking to you. Okay, Mama. Other people have to ride in the elevator. They won't want to sit where your feet have been. Okay, Mama. Why you insisted on going downtown on the elevator instead of a bus, I don't know. Riding long up in the air, looking in everybody's backyard. You used to be crazy about streetcars. Now it's the elevated. Sometimes I just don't understand you. Mama. Yes? If the elevator fell off the tracks and the soldier was going to step on the third rail and I pushed him off and saved his life, would I get the Purple Heart? The elevator is not going to fall off its tracks and you're not going to save a soldier. Is that why you... (laughs) (laughs) 
Mama? Yes. Why do people have old, dirty houses? Because... Because they don't make enough money. Take your feet off the seat. Oh, yes, Mama. Mama. Mm-hmm. Then why don't they just build them nice, clean new houses? <sighs> Who'd pay for it? Oh, gosh, everybody. Everybody's got to look at it when they pass by, so why doesn't everybody fix it up? Because... I don't know, Tommy. I really don't. Now, take your feet off the seat. Other people have to sit down. Important buildings and museums. Miss Rogers says this is very important because if a city has many important buildings and museums, it is important. Well, Chicago has sure got them. There is a house right near where we live which is absolutely haunted. A man murdered his wife and cut her head off, or she murdered him and cut his head off, and, and there goes walking in the house, and if you go in there, your hair will turn white and fall out at the roots, and you'll lose all your teeth. There's a big sign in front that says for sale, but no one will buy it. My father says it is because of the success of taxes, but I say it is because of the success of ghosts, which is a pretty good joke if you get it. Keep it. Miss Rogers, my teacher, says we should not make wisecracks in this letter to our Chinese allies. So I will cross this out later on. But meanwhile, it will sit there on the paper. And she can go kiss Van Johnson for all I care. Which is another joke, because she does not wear bobby socks. Besides the haunted house, other important buildings are... Palm Olive Building, Ridley Building, Tribune Tower, Art Institute, Stockyards which are really not a building, but which are very important for hamburgers and smells. A joke. All these are very important buildings, including the planetarium, which is full of stars, and the big museum, which is right in the lake. This museum is the most wonderful building in the whole world, being full of stuffed animals and people, which are very lifelike, only they do not breathe. It is very educational. The halls are very slippery, making for very fine sliding when the guard is not looking. It is very educational. My friend Fatso and me, I often go to the museum on Saturdays and vacations to improve our mind when we have no place else to go. In here, Fatso, in here. Okay. Why, was that our close one? I told you not to make so much noise. I was just trying out the echo, that's all. Oh, you're a creep. You want to get arrested or something? Partner, the jail ain't been built that can hold me. Okay, okay. But if that guard catches us, he'll fan your backside and he's not fooling. Say, what's this room? I don't know. You've never been here before. Gosh, are they all stuffed? You creep. They're, they're statues. The Hall of Man. Hey, look at this one. Hey, that's a Ubangi. Don't give me none of your lips, sister. <laughs> Boy, is she a mess. Hey, look at this one. Looks just like old Mr. Spinelli. Southern Italian. <laughs> that's what Mr. Spinelli is. Look at this one. He's like Mr. Goldberg. Yeah, I'm Mr. Goldberg. Look at this one. He's an Indian. Yeah, hey, look at this one, a Chinaman. This one says Australian Bushman. Yeah, and here's one like Mr. Brovsky. Gosh, look at all of them. All different kinds. Sure are a lot of people in the world. Yeah. Gee, I'm glad I'm me. Me too. Look at that one. Hey, how do you think it feels to have skin like that? Huh? Skin like that. How does it feel? I don't know. It feels the same, I guess. Bet you it doesn't. Well, I bet you it does. My pop says that the color of your skin is just an, an accident of pigmentation. What is that? Well, it's... Jeepers, do I have to tell you everything? Don't you know that everybody in the world is related to everybody else on account of Darwin? Who's he? Oh, I read about him. He invented evolution. Everybody's related to everybody. It's a scientific fact. Okay, I'm related to everybody. Hi, you bangy. What's buzzing, cousin? <laughs> Well, Chui Sim, I have now told you practically everything there is to tell you about Chicago, which is a good job well done. I will now break my arm patting myself in the back. Also, the pen is out of ink. All... 
Oh, excuse me, please. I think I hear... Hey, Ellen? Ellen? Hey, sis, is that you at the icebox? You write your letter and mind your own business. Now, you leave me a piece, you hear me? You leave me a piece. Maybe I will and maybe I won't. Dear Chewie Sen, you'll have to excuse me now because my sister Ellen is at the icebox where the chicken we had left from dinner is, so I'd better get out there before she eats me out of house and home. My teacher, Miss Rogers, says to be sure we didn't leave anything out. So I'll close by saying that Chicago also has Lincoln Park, very large lake for swimming and drowning, only they have lifeguards, and there's Wrigley Field and Sox Park, which are full of baseball, only I am like my father and I'm a football man, and Jackson Park and department stores, which are very large grocery departments where they used to give away free samples, only not the kids, and Soldiers Field and a very good fire department, which could have stopped the big Chicago fire. Only all of these firemen were children when it happened, and, uh, and, and lots and lots of people. Chicago's full of people. One of these people, like I said, is now in the kitchen at the icebox, so I will sign off. I am sure with what I have told you about my Chicago, if you should ever come here, you would be able to find your way around. <laughs> if you go to White City, which is our amusement park, and get on the merry-go-round and stay on it. This is another joke. Well, this is the end. Yours, cordially, sincerely, and very truly yours, your obedient servant, Thomas J. Jones. P.S. There's something I forgot to tell you. My Chicago is the biggest, best city in the whole world. I know, because I've lived here all my life. In case you come visit us, our house is the second from the corner. My father's back again, looking over my shoulder, and he says... Add RSVP. I will now do this, RSVP. That is my father's idea. I am your pal. That is my own idea. This finishes my letter. I hope I have now brought understanding between nations, which is a very good thing. <laughs> You have just heard My Chicago, a new play by Arch Obler. The role of Tommy was taken by Tommy Cook. Included in the cast were Kathy Lewis, Eddie McCambridge, B. Benaderet, Truda Marson, Joe Gilbert, and Evelyn Scott. The original music was composed and conducted by Jack Meekin. Next week, we'll bring you a new play dedicated to the Army Air Forces with the Academy Award winner Van Heflin, just discharged from the Army Air Forces, in the leading role. This will be the 17th in a special series of plays written, produced, and directed for the Mutual Broadcasting System by Arch Obler. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Okay. There it was. My oh, I guess. My that was the Mutual Broadcasting System. Oh, gosh. Kathy Lewis. Yeah, B. Benaderet. She was married to Jim Bannon, wasn't she? I'm not <laughs> sure of that. Yeah. I know she was on Petticoat Junction in the 60s on yeah. TV. <laughs> she was one of the greats. Oh, my God. I never got off the mic. Uh, <laughs> Did it, you remember that as you were hearing it? A little bit, a uh, little bits and pieces. Uh, that was in 1945? Yes, uh, July 26, 1945. I was 15 years old. I still sounded like I was 10 or 11. <laughs> oh, God. They don't write like that anymore. No, that that should be a like the poster poster child for the city of Chicago even today. They yeah. really went into detail about the city. Yeah, uh, good old Arch. I wish I was back there then. Well, I guess on radio that they just don't have dramatic shows like that anymore on radio unless they're nope. playing an old an old uh, time show. Is there any way that um, I could get these these uh, two recordings of yours, John? Sure, sure. We can have them put on CD and mail them to you. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Then you can go to the good old days of radio show when these are um, put out and you can listen to it there. It'll always be up there. You won't have a physical copy to hold in your hand, but you can always go to the good old days of radio show uh, website yeah. and look and listen to it there. The complete show with your comments and my comments yeah. and the whole thing. Yeah, please do that. Please, please do that. Absolutely. And I wish that I could work with you again sometime doing uh, Paul Reversky. Well, when I find it, I, I don't know where it is at the moment, but if I can find it, there's also the Jolson story you mentioned that you were on that on Lux Radio Theater. Yeah. I know I have but, that here. But Paul Reversky was on February 8th, 1942. There was a lot of humanity in that um, that show. It was during the wartime, and I was telling my father that uh, America's in deep trouble, and we, we all have to do something. we got to help the war effort. And so I go to the Army to try to get in the Army, and they look at me and start laughing, and they said, uh, uh, go home, laddie boy. Just... Well, why don't you try the Navy? So I go to the Navy, and I said, I want to join the Navy. My dad said we're in real trouble. And uh, so they do the same thing, and they send me to the Air Force. And finally, uh, uh, I'm heartbroken. I'm in a park, and um, Hans Conried comes along. He's a conscientious objector. And we start talking, and he's got a letter from the government saying that uh, he's been drafted in the Army. And he says, I don't have any complaints against anybody. Why do I have to fight? I don't want to go. And uh, I say, well, then give me, give me that letter. Let me have it. Let me go, because I want to join, and I want to help. And he said, son, you go home. I'll do what I have to. You never can tell. But it was so beautifully written, and of course, or uh, Gordon Jenkins' music. And uh, but I'm doing that with um, uh, Hans Conried playing the conscientious objector. It was beautifully written, and I uh, I really enjoyed that performance. I never realized how grateful it was to be able to work with a genius. And that's what he was. Archobler was a genius. Well, and, it's, uh, it's interesting because earlier in this series, we played a show called Johnny Got His Gun with yep. Jim, with Jimmy Cagney. And that show, uh, not written by Archobler, but adapted for radio by Archobler and on Archobler's plays, that yep. show was very anti-war and very uh, just totally against the idea of people doing anything with war. And then when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, everything changed, including yeah. Arch Obler's approach to things, because all of a sudden he's <laughs> writing something like you're just describing about yeah. how we all got to go and do our part and win the war type thing. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, uh... The contrast between the two is quite stark, but it reflects the contrast between the two schools of thought in America, too, because America didn't want to go to war in 1939 and 40, but then we did, and then we went yep. wholeheartedly into it and won it. So, Unlike what we do today, where we go half-heartedly into everything and lose everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. You know, um, talking about the... Uh the great writer, producer, directors in the good old radio days uh, uh, with Orson Welles. And I had the privilege of doing uh, a few shows with Orson. One show I remember in rehearsal when we were all sitting around the table and uh, reading the, the script for the first time. He stops reading the script and he starts to tell us a story. And we don't know whether he's this is true, whether he's making it up or what. And he goes on and on for about 40 minutes. And finally, the director said, well, we're going to, that's it for today. We'll have to come back tomorrow and uh, continue this. But I got to tell you one more thing with uh, Orson Welles. I get a call from New York, an advertising agency. Mr. Cook uh, we understand that um, 
you know Orson Welles, that you've worked with him, and that maybe you could help us, we'd be happy to, happy to pay uh, for your time and efforts. But um, we need to get a hold of him. We'd like him to do a commercial for the Nika Whiskey Company. Um, the commercial will only be shown in Asia, mostly Japan, and it won't be shown in America. Can you help us? I said, yeah, I can, I can, I can find Orson. I'll get back to you. So I check around, and I find that Orson is staying at Peter Bogdanovich's home, the great film director. And so um, I call over to Peter's home. I get Orson on the well on the phone, and I tell him about it. And he says, yeah, yeah, uh, okay, set it up. Yeah, I'll do it. So it's all set. We found the place where we're going to shoot the commercial. Orson is there with his own cinematographer, Gary Graver, and we're ready to do it. And all of a sudden, Orson says, you know something? I think we can do a better job. We can make it more interesting if we shoot this commercial in Paris, France. And they all look at him, and guess what? They went to Paris, France, and did the commercial with Orson Welles. That was Orson. He wanted a free trip to yeah, Europe. A free trip to France, so he yeah, figured out yeah. a way to get it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's a true story. Uh, and again, it brings back uh, the most wonderful times in my life. And, well, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about a couple things? Do you remember the last radio show you did? Jeez, I don't. Um, I'm still doing radio shows. Well, okay. We have, the last we radio have, show uh, back then, <laughs> in yeah. the 40s and 50s. We have two old time radio shows. They sort of stopped during the COVID, but one was called Reps Radio Enthusiasts of Puget Sound. I would fly up to Seattle each year and um, star in uh, some of the all-time great uh, radio shows. And also there was one called Spurdvac. I'm sure yes. you've heard of I that. I know that. I've been yeah. in Spurdvac and, since 1975. Right. And um, so I'm hoping that they will uh, come back and that I can keep, keep doing uh those shows, uh, they're so much fun. And uh, did you do any television in the '60s and '70s? Yeah, or I, like I did that? a lot of I did a lot of television shows, and I was starred in six independent films. One of which was *The Vicious Years*, written by Ann Richard Nash, who wrote *The Rainmaker*. And I won the uh, I won the Photoplay Magazine Award for uh, leading performance of the year. That was very interesting. And um, Teenage Crime Wave I starred in. And uh, Cry of the City, a 20th Century Fox film. I played um, Richard Conti's brother. And Victor Bouture was also uh, a starred in that film. Shelley Winters, one of her first films. It was the first film for Deborah Padgett. And I had a crush on her. And uh, when the film ended... Uh, we lived near each other, and um, I called her and um, I had arranged to take her out on a weekend. So I arrive at her apartment, and I knock on the door, and the door opens, and this big, huge woman says, yes. And I said, well, I'm Tommy Cook. I'm a friend of your daughter's, and we worked together in a film. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I said, I'm here to uh, take her out. Oh, yes, yes. Hold on. She shuts the door, and I'm standing out and waiting for three or four minutes, and the door opens, and there's Deborah. Deborah, she says, hi, Tommy. How are you? I said, oh, I'm fine. You look great, Deborah. Okay, can we go? Yeah. And Deborah and I walk out with the mother. Mm. No way in the world she's going to allow her daughter to be out on the streets with me and she was with us 
on my date. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you were a dangerous guy, I guess. Yes, I was a dangerous guy. <laughs> but um, the wonderful adventures that I've had in the entertainment world, I mean, such great days. And uh, now, you know, I'm, um, <clears throat> I created two films. One was Roller Coaster. I wrote the original I story saw that line. movie. That's 1977, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was with George Siegel. I, I, I wrote the storyline and the marketing strat strategy, and I sold it to a producer, Jennings Lang, at Universal. And um, that was fun. I was able to take my family to the world premiere at the... Uh, uh, Academy of Motion Pictures Theater. I've been a member of the Academy for so many years. We have our own theater in Beverly Hills on Wilshire Bill Boulevard, and that was a thrill to have my family there. And roller and coaster, I, roller coaster was one of the first movies where they had like the the surround sound type stuff in the theater. Yes. So it was yeah, insane. that's what I remember. So when the roller coaster went by, the th seats were shaking and all that. Yes, yes. It was in Sense Around. Sense Around, that's it. I've been working on uh, the follow-up, and it's called White Knuckles Last Ride. <laughs> but with the technology of today, you know, there was no CGI's computer graphics in, in those days at all. Can you imagine this is an amusement park film? And um, uh, can you imagine the kind of excitement that we can have now on those roller coasters. So um, I'm uh, very excited about that. I've, I'm uh, working with my, uh, I've got two writers been working with me on it, and hopefully I can make a deal and uh, get it into production next year. But it's the kind of film that uh, uh, the protagonist uh, be perfect for uh, Jennifer Lawrence or Scarlett Johansson. And... Um, uh, for the male uh, lead, Chris Evans. I saw Chris Evans in a film called Gifted. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar no, with that film. No, I don't film. know that one. Years and years and years ago. And it was about a story where he, his sister dies and leaves her child to Chris. And um, he takes this girl in and they develop a relationship that is so unique and loving. And finally, he has to give up the child to a family that is looking, you know, to adopt. And uh, so the child is taken from him, and he can't take it. And finally, he goes to the family, and he gets the daughter back, and she pounds on his, sh on his chest and said, Why did you leave me? Don't you love me? Don't you love me? And he says, yes, yes, I love you. I will always have you. But it was a beautiful, low-budget film, but I've never for forgotten that with Chris Evans, how I would like him to be the, uh, the uh, leading protagonist. And for the uh, antagonist, a young kid, Timothy Chalamet, would be absolutely perfect to play the, uh, the sinister young guy in my film, he would be absolutely perfect. And then to play the uh, father, my old buddy, Bo Bridges. Remember Bo Bridges? Uh, when I was putting on so many celebrity charity tennis tournaments around the world, and a lot of them in Monaco with Prince Renier and Princess Grace, Lloyd and Bo Bridges were with me in all my events. Farrah Fawcett, Clint Eastwood, John Forsyth. Ah, those were the days. I missed the tennis wars, I really did. I was uh, a Southern California junior champion way back and um, played the circuit. You know, I created the, um, the Bobby Riggs, Billie Jean King Battle of the Sexes that was on. <laughs> that was you, huh? Yeah, okay. I created that. And then I had the series for three years on CBS, The Challenge of the Sexes. Those were memorable times, too. No, I'm very much a lover of tennis, follow everything that's going on now. But uh, you can imagine I've had uh, quite a glorious life, thanks to my mom and all the wonderful, wonderful, gifted, creative, loving people 
from the industry. I don't know of any people that were more loving and creative and beautiful than the uh, people involved in the, in the creative community. I understand you were at a comic book convention recently. Yeah, that last weekend, um, that was at the Burbank Marriott Hotel. It was nice because I ran into uh, several actors that I had worked with over the years, like Christy McNichol and uh, people like that. It was nice. I've done a lot of those over so many years. It wasn't the kind of audience that really was into my sphere of show business, you know. William Shatner was one of the stars there, and it was more into the people from Star Trek and stuff. But it was not. It was nice to be there and 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 signed a lot of autographs and stuff and say hello to some of my old time friends. That was nice. So tell us um, about Red Rider and Red Rider rifles. Well, the um, the Daisy Air Rifle, which was part of the um, the Adventures of Red Rider twelve episode serial at uh, Republic Studios. That was way back in 1940. It's 10 years old. Republic Studios, you know, where they started all the Westerns with John Wayne, etc. It was with Don Redberry. And then, of course, uh, doing the radio show, uh, the ABC radio show, but at NBC, Studio H. And, of course, uh, then they continued doing the Red Rider films, but in a t totally different setup, not at Republic, with the different actors. And then uh, my old friend Michael Gubatosi, also known as Robert Blake, took over as uh, Little Beaver. For the uh, serial, we had two directors, William Whitney and John English. And William Whitney had um, his own horses at his home. And on weekends, I used to go to his home and ride his horse ride horseback with him and then of course uh, uh, that became uh, exciting for me when I would be on the little papoose <laughs> my little horse in the film uh, we would shoot it out in um, in the Encino area in the valley area of Los Angeles and in those days you could buy an acre for about ten dollars but that was an that was enjoyable. The radio show was done with Reed Hadley played uh, the father. He was six feet four, and I was like four feet six. So, it was, <laughs> but um, yeah. Right. Anyway, getting back to the Daisy Rifle. Yeah, somehow my my wife uh, heard from the Daisy Rifle people and set it up. I'm going there on Wednesday, and I'm going to be the guest of honor. I'm going to sign one hundred Daisy Rifles that. Um, and uh, so that'll be a nice little thing for me. And it'll give me a chance to uh, go back and relive <laughs> some of the history with uh, Little Beaver. Little so, Beaver. Well, how about any listener of this podcast who wants a daisy rifle signed by Mr. Tommy Cook? You contact us. We'll put you in contact with Tommy Cook and you can get one. That's the, that's the way to go. That, that would be the way to do it, to contact <laughs> you. And we go from... Okay. We go from there. All right. uh, you know, uh, one last little story with uh, Robert Blake. I uh, last ran into him. We were good buddies. And um, I had to go to the Van Nuys court in the Valley uh, to pay a parking ticket for my son. And that was right at the time when uh, Robert Blake was going through the, uh, the uh, murder situation with Bonnie Lee Blakely. So I parked there in the parking lot and started to walk. And all of a sudden I look and I see Bobby. He sees me and we walk up to each other. We put our arms around her, each other. And I said, oh, Bobby, Bobby, you got to stay tough. Got to stay tough. He says, Tommy, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I got a pay a parking ticket i don't i don't know where to go i'm, I'm at the courthouse I, but i'll find my way he says no problem no problem here's what you do tommy 
You go to the front door, you go in, you get in the elevator, you go up to the second floor, you turn right, you go down to the hall, there'll be a teller there, and you just go there and you pay your ticket. And I said, oh, well, thank you, Bobby. Thank you. I'll see you around. So that was my last uh, conversation with Bobby Blake, and I guess he just passed away. I found out from a friend of mine who was with me at this um, comic.com last weekend at the um, at the uh, Burbank Marriott Theater that Bobby Blake ended up at the Motion Picture Hospital in Woodland Hills. He must have uh, gone broke, lost his apartment and everything, and uh, died at the Motion Picture Country Home. I never knew that. No, I didn't know that either. I know he passed away, but I don't know anything yeah. beyond that. That's yeah. sad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thank you very much for everything you did back then. It was a joy to hear these two programs that we have featured on the last two weeks of the Good Old Days of Radio Show podcast here. And you've been so generous with your time and ask, answering my questions and telling us stories about the great days in radio. It was great to do that. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you, and I wish you all the best. All right. Well, this is John Tefteller in the Good Old Days of Radio Show. We'll be back on Thursday with our salute to Arch Obler and back next week with more. So until then, thanks for listening. Goodbye.